The Essentials of Prayer by Edward McHenry Bounds Forward by Homer W. H. The work of editing the Bounds Spiritual Life Books, of which the present volume is the sixth, has been a labor of love, which has brought great profit and blessing to my own soul. After years of close study of the literary reminds of this great Christian together with the work of other mystics, I am fully persuaded that to but few of the sons of men has there been given such spiritual power as was vouchsafed to Edward McHenry Bounds. Truly, he was a burning and a shining light, and as the Sunday School Times says, he was a specialist in prayer and his books are for the quiet hour, for careful meditation, and for all who wish to seek and find the treasures of God. It was my great privilege to know the author well. And also to know that his intention in everything he wrote was for the salvation of his readers. The essentials of prayer is sent forth in this spirit. May God bless it to many hearts and use it for the upbuilding and strengthening of Christian character through the length and breadth of the land. Homer W. Hedge, Flushing, New York. The Essentials of Prayer, Chapter 1. Prayer takes in the whole man. Henry Clay Trumbull spoke forth the infinite in the terms of our world and the eternal in the forms of our human life. Some years ago, on a ferry boat, I met a gentleman who knew him and I told him that when I had last seen Dr. Trumbull a fortnight before he had spoken of him oh yes said my friend he was a great Christian so real so intense he was at my home years ago and we were talking about prayer why Trumbull I said you don't mean to say if you lost a pencil, you would pray about it and ask God to help you find it. Of course I would. Of course I would, was his instant and excited reply. Of course he would. Was not his faith a real thing? Was not his faith a real thing? Like the Saviour, he put his doctrine strongly by taking an extreme illustration to embody his principle. But the principle was fundamental. He did trust God in everything, and the father honoured the trust of his child. Robert E. Speer Prayer has to do with the entire man. Prayer takes in man in his whole being, mind, soul, and body. It takes the whole man to pray. 
and prayer affects the entire man in its gracious results as the whole nature of man enters into prayer so also all that belongs to man is the beneficiary of prayer all of man receives benefits in prayer the whole man must be given to god in praying the largest results in praying come to him who gives himself all of himself all that belongs to himself to god this is the secret of full consecration and this is a condition of successful praying and the sort of praying which brings the largest fruits the men of olden times who wrought well in prayer who brought largest things to pass who moved god to do great things were those who were entirely given over to god in their praying god wants and must have all that there is in man in answering his prayers he must have wholehearted men through whom to work out his purposes and plans concerning men god must have men in their entirety no double minded man need apply no vacillating man can be used no man with a divided allegiance to god and the world and self can do the praying that is needed holiness is holiness and so god wants holy men men whole hearted and true for his service and for the work of praying and the very god of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ these are the sort of men god wants for leaders of the hosts of israel and these are the kind out of which the praying class is formed man is a trinity in one and yet man is neither a trinity nor a dual creature when he prays but a unit man is one in all the essential in all the essentials and acts and attitudes of pity soul spirit and body are to unite in all things pertaining to life and godliness the body first of all engages in prayer since it assumes the praying attitude in prayer prostration of the body becomes as in praying as well as prostration of the soul the attitude of the body counts much in prayer although it is true that the heart may be hearty and lifted up and the mind listless and wandering and the praying a mere form even while the knees are bent in prayer daniel kneeled upon his knees three times a day in prayer solomon kneeled in prayer at the dedication of the temple our lord in gethsemane prostrated himself in the memorable season of praying just before his betrayal where there is earnest and faithful praying the body always takes on the form most suited to the state of the soul at that time the body that far joins the soul in praying the entire man must pray the whole man life heart temper mind are in it each and all join in the prayer exercise doubt double mindedness division of the affections are all foreign to the closet character and conduct undefiled made with her than made whiter than snow are mighty potencies and are the most seemly beauties for the closet hour and for the struggles of prayer a loyal intellect must conspire and add the energy and fire of its undoubting and undivided faith to that kind of all over the hour of prayer necessarily the mind enters into the praying first of all it takes 
taught to pray. The intellect teaches us we ought to pray. By serious thinking beforehand, the mind prepares itself for approaching a throne of grace. Thought goes before entering into the closet and prepares the way for the true praying. It consider what will be asked for in the closet hour. True praying does not leave to the inspiration of the hour what will be the request of the tower as praying is asking for something definite of god so beforehand the thought arises we what shall i ask for at this hour what shall i ask for at this hour all vain and evil and frivolous thoughts are eliminated and the mind is given over entirely to god thinking of god and what is needed and what has been received in the past by every token prayer in taking hold of the entire man does not leave out the mind the very first step in prayer is a mental one the disciples took that first step when they said unto jesus at one time lord teach us to pray we must be taught through the intellect and just in so far as the intellect is given up to god in prayer will we be able to learn well and readily the lesson of prayer all spreads the nature of prayer over the whole man it must be so it takes the whole man to embrace in its god like sympathies the entire race of man the sorrows the sins and the death of adam's fallen race it takes the whole man to run parallel with god's high and sublime will in saving mankind it takes the whole man to stand with our lord jesus christ as the one mediator between god and sinful man this is the doctrine paul teaches in his prayer directory in the second chapter of his first epistle to timothy nowhere does it appear so clearly that it requires the entire man in all departments of his being to pray than in this teaching of paul it takes the whole man to pray till all the storms which agitate his soul are calmed to a great calm till the stormy winds and waves cease as by a godlike spell it takes the whole man to pray till cruel tyrants and unjust rulers are changed in their natures and lives as well as in their governing qualities or till they cease to rule it requires the entire man in praying till high and proud and unspiritual ecclesiastics become gentle lowly and religious till godliness and gravity bear role in church and in state in home and in business in public as well as in private life it is man's business to pray and it takes manly men to do it it is godly business to pray and it takes godly men to do it and it is godly men who give over themselves entirely to prayer prayer is far reaching in its influence and in its uh, gracious effects it is intense and profound business which deals with god and his plans and purposes and it takes whole hearted men to do it no half hearted half brained half spirited effort will do for this serious all important heavenly business the whole heart the whole brain the whole spirit must be in the matter of praying which is so mightily to affect the characters and destinies of men the answer of jesus to the scribe as to what was the first and greatest commandment was as follows the lord our god is one lord Shema Israel Elekhad and thou shall love the Lord thy God 
with all thy heart and with thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength in one word the entire man without reservation must love god so it takes the same entire man to do the praying which god requires of man all the powers of man must be engaged in it god cannot tolerate a divided heart in the love he requires of man neither can he bear with a divided man in praying in the 119th psalm the psalmist teaches this very truth in these words blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart it takes whole hearted men to keep god's commandments and its demands the same sort of men to seek god these are they who are counted blessed upon these whole hearted ones god's approval rests bringing the case closer home to himself the psalmist makes this declaration as to his practice with my whole heart have i sought thee oh let me not wander from thy commandments and further on giving us his prayer for a wise and understanding heart he tells us his purposes concerning the keeping of god's law give me understanding and i shall keep thy law yeah i shall observe it with my whole heart just as it requires a whole heart given to god to gladly and fully obey god's commandments so it takes a whole heart to do effectual praying because it requires the whole man to pray praying is no easy task praying is far more than simply bending the knee and saying a few words by rote it's not enough to bend the knee and words of prayer to say the heart must with the lips agree or else we do not pray praying is no light and trifling exercise while children should be taught early to pray praying is no child task praying is no child's task prayer draws upon the whole nature of man prayer engages all the powers of man's mortal all the powers of man's moral and spiritual nature prayer engages all the powers of man's moral and spiritual nature it is this which explains somewhat the praying of our lord described as in hebrews 5 7 who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared it takes only a moment's thought to see how such praying of our lord drew mightily upon all the powers of his being and called into exercise every part of his nature this is the praying which brings the soul close to god and which brings god down to earth body soul and spirit are taxed and brought under tribute to prayer david brinard makes this record of his praying god enabled me to agonize in prayer till i was wet with perspiration though in the shade and in a cool place the son of god in gethsemane was in an agony of prayer which engaged his whole being and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done nevertheless not my will but thine be done and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening him and being in an agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground look 22 40 44 he was praying which laid its hand 
on every part of our lord's nature which called forth all the powers of his soul his mind and his body this was praying which took in the entire man Paul was acquainted with this kind of praying in writing to the Roman Christians he urged them to pray with him after this fashion now i beseech you brethren for the lord jesus christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to god for me the words strive together with me tells of paul's praying and how much he put into it it is not a docile request not a light thing this sort of praying this thrive this thriving with me it is of the nature of a great battle a conflict to win a great battle to be fought the praying christian as the soldier fights a life and death struggle his honor his immortality and eternal life are all in it this is praying as the athlete struggles for the mastery and for the crown and as he wrestles or runs a race everything depends on the strength he puts in it energy order swiftness every power of his nature is in it every power is quickened and strained to its very utmost every power is quickened and strained to its very utmost littleness half heartedness weakness and laziness are all absent just as it takes the whole man to pray successfully so in turn the whole man receives the benefits of such praying as every part of man's complex being enters into true praying so every part of that same nature receives blessings from god in answer to such praying this kind of praying engages our undivided hearts our full consent to be the lord's our whole desires God sees to it that when the whole man prays in turn the whole man shall be blessed his body takes in the good of praying for much praying is done specifically for the body food and raiment health and bodily vigor come in answer to praying clear mental action right thinking and enlightened understanding and safe reasoning powers come from praying divine guidance means god so moving and imp- impressing the mind that we shall make wise and safe decisions divine guidance means god so moving and impressing the mind that we shall make wise and safe decisions the meek will he guide in judgment many a praying preacher has been greatly helped just at this point the unction of the holy one which comes upon the preacher invigorates the mind loosens up thought and gives utterance this is the explanation of former days when men of very limited education had such wonderful liberty of the spirit in praying and in preaching their thoughts flowed as a stream of water their entire intellectual machinery felt the impulse of the divine spirit's gracious influences and of course the soul receives large benefits in this sort of praying thousands can testify to this statement so we repeat that as the entire man comes into play in true earnest effectual praying so the entire man's soul mind and body receives the benefits of prayer The Essentials of Prayer by Edward McHenry Bounds, Chapter 2 Prayer and Humility If two angels were to receive at the same moment a commission from God, one to go down and rule earth's grandest empire, the other to go and sweep the streets of its meanest village, it would be a matter of entire indifference to each which service fell to his lot the post of ruler or the post of scavenger but the joy of the angels lies only in obedience to god's will and with equal joy they would lift a lazarus in his rags to abraham's bosom 
or be a chariot of fire to carry on to carry an eliza home john newton if two angels were to receive at the same moment a commission from god one to go down and rule earth's greatest earth's grandest empire the other to go and sweep the streets of its meanest village it would be a matter of entire indifference to each which service fell to his lot the post of ruler or the post of scavenger but the joy of the angels lies only in obedience to god's will and with equal joy they would lift a lazarus in his rags to abraham's bosom or be a chariot of fire to carry an eliza home john newton to be humble is to have a low estimate of oneself it is to be modest lowly with a disposition to seek obscurity humility retires itself from the public gaze it does not seek publicity for it doesn't seek publicity nor hunt for high places neither does it care for prominence humility is retiring in its nature self abasement belongs to humility it is given to self depreciation it never exalts itself in the eyes of others nor even in the eyes of itself modesty is one of its most prominent characteristics in humility there is the total absence of pride it is at the very farthest distance from anything like self conceit there is no self praise in humility rather it has the disposition to praise others in honor preferring one another it is not given to self exaltation humility does not allow the uppermost seats and aspire to the highest places it is willing to take the lowest seat and prefers those places where it will be unnoticed the prayer of humility is after this fashion never let the world break in fix a mighty gulf between keep me humble and unknown prized and loved by god alone humility does not have its eyes on self but rather on god and others it is for in spirit make in behavior lowly in heart with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love the parable of the pharisee and publican is a sermon in brief on humility and self praise the pharisee given over to self conceit wrapped up in himself seeing only his own self righteous deeds catalogs his virtues before god despising the poor publican who stands afar off he exalts himself gives himself over to self praise is self centered and goes away unjustified condemned and rejected by god the publican says no good in himself is overwhelmed with self depreciation far removed from anything which would take any credit for any good in himself does not presume to lift his eyes to heaven but with downcast countenance smites himself on his breast and cries out god be merciful to me a sinner our lord with great preciseness gives us the sequel of the story of these two men one utterly devoid of humility and other utterly submerged in the spirit of self depreciation and lowliness of mind i tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted luke 1814 god puts a great price on humility of heart it is good to be clothed with humility as with a garment it is written god resists the proud but giveth grace to the humble that which brings the praying soul near to god in humility of heart that which gives wings to pray in lowliness of mind that which gives ready access to the throne of grace in self depreciation pride self esteem and self praise effectually shut the door of prayer he who would come to god must approach him with self hid 
from his eyes he who would approach he who would come to god must approach him with self hid from his eyes he must not be puffed up with self conceit nor be possessed with an overestimate of his virtues and good works humility is a rare christian grace of great price in the courts of heaven entering into the being and inseparable condition of effectual praying it gives access to god when other qualities fail it takes many descriptions to describe it and many definitions to define it it is a rare and retiring grace its full portrait is found only in the lord jesus christ our prayers must must be set low before they can ever rise high our prayers ma- must have much of the dust on them before they can ever have much of the glory of the skies in them in our lord's teaching humility has such prominence in his system of religion and is such a distinguishing feature of his character that to leave it out of his lesson on prayer would be very unseemly would not comport with his character and would not fit into his religious system the parable of the pharisee and publican stands out in such bold relief that we must again refer to it the pharisee seemed to be in order to pray certainly he should have known by that time how to pray but alas like many others he seemed never to have learned this invaluable lesson he lives business and business hours and walks with steady and fixed steps up to the house of prayer the position and place are well chosen by him there is the sacred place the sacred hour and the sacred name each and all invoked by this seemingly praying man but this praying ecclesiastic though schooled to prayer by training and by his habit prays not words are uttered by him but words are not prayer god hears his words only to condemn him a death chill has come from those formal lips of prayer a death cuts from god is on his words of prayer a solution of pride has entirely poisoned the prayer offering of that hour his entire praying has been impregnated with self praise self congratulation and self exaltation that season of temple going has had no worship whatever in it that season of temple going has had no worship whatever in it on the other hand the publican smitten with a deep sense of his sins and his inward sinfulness realizing how poor in spirit he is how utterly devoid of anything like righteousness goodness or any quality which we command him to god his pride within utterly blasted and dead falls down with humiliation and despair before god while he utters a sharp cry for mercy for his sins and guilt a sense of sin and a realization of utter unworthiness has fixed the roots of humility deep down in his soul and has oppressed self and i and heart downward to the dust this is the picture of humility against pride in praying here we see by sharp contrast the utter worthlessness of self righteousness self exaltation and self praise in praying and the great value the beauty and the divine commendation which comes to humility of heart self depreciation and self condemnation when a soul comes before god in prayer happy are they who have no righteousness of their own to plead and no goodness of their own of which to boast humility flourishes in the soil of a true and deep sense of our sinfulness and our nothingness nowhere does humility grow so rankly as so and so rapidly and shine so brightly as when it feels all guilty confesses all sin and trusts all grace i the chief of sinners am but jesus died for me this is praying ground the ground of humility low down far away seemingly but in reality brought nigh by the blood of the 
Lord Jesus Christ. God dwells in the lowly places. He makes such lowly places really the high places to the praying soul. Let the world there what you boast. Their words of righteousness. I, a wretch, undone and lost, am really saved by grace. Other tied I disclaim. This, only this, is all my plea. I, the chief of sinners, am, but Jesus died for me. Humility is an indispensable requisite of true prayer. It must be an attribute, a characteristic of prayer. Humility must be in the praying character as light is in the sun. Prayer has no beginning, no ending, no being without humility. As a ship is made for the sea, so prayer is made for humility and so humility is made for prayer. Humility is not abstraction from self nor does it ignore thought about self. It is a many-faced principle. Humility is born by looking at God and His holiness and then looking at self and man's unholiness. Humility loves obscurity and silence, dreads applause, esteems the virtues of others, ex excuses their faults with mildness, easily pardons injuries, fears contempt less and less, and sees baseness and falsehood in pride. A true nobleness and gentleness are in humility. It knows and rewards the inestimable riches of the cross and the humiliation of Jesus Christ. It fears the lustre of those virtues admired by men and loves those that are more secret and which are prized by God. It draws comfort even from its own defects through the abasement which they occasion. It prefers any degree of compunction before all light in the world. Somewhat after this order of description is the definable grace of humility so perfectly drawn in the publican's prayer and so entirely absent from the prayer of the Farsi. It takes many sittings to make a good picture of it. Humility holds in its keeping the very life of prayer. Neither pride nor vanity can pray. Humility though is much more than the absence of vanity and pride. Humility though is much more than the absence of vanity and pride. It is a positive quality, a substantial force which energizes prayer. There is no power in prayer to ascend without it. Humility springs from a lowly estimate of ourselves and of our deservings. The Farsi prayed not though well schooled and habituated to pray because there was no humility in his praying the publican prayed though banned by the public and receiving no encouragement from church sentiment because he prayed in humility to be clothed with humility is to be clothed with a praying garment humility unworthy humility is just feeling little because we are little Humility is realizing our unworthiness because we are unworthy. The feeling and declaring ourselves <coughs> sinners because we are sinners. Kneeling well becomes us as the attitude of prayer because it betokens humility. The Pharisee's proud estimate of himself and his supreme contempt for his neighbor closed the gates of prayer to him while humility opened wide those gates to the defamed and revealed publican. That fearful saying of our Lord about the works of big religious workers in the later part of the Sermon on the Mount is called out by proud estimates of work and wrong estimates of prayer. Many shall say unto me in the day, Lord, Lord, we have, have we not prophesied in thy name? Many shall say unto me in the day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful things. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Humility is the first and last attribute of Christly religion, and the first and last attribute of Christly praying. There is no Christ without humility, there is no praying without humility. If 
thou wouldst learn well the art of praying then learn well the lesson of humility how graceful and imperative does the attitude of humility becomes to us humility is one of the unchanging and exacting attitudes of prayer dust ashes earth upon the head sackcloth for the body and fasting for the appetites but the symbols of humility for the old testament saints sackcloth fasting and ashes brought daniel to lowliness before god and brought gabriel to him the angels are fond of the sackcloth and ashes men how lowly The angels are fond of the sackcloth and ashes men. How lowly the attitude of Abraham, the friend of God, when pleading for God to stay his wrath against Sodom, which am but sackcloth and ashes. With what humility does Solomon appear before God? His grandeur is abased. and his glory and majesty are retired as he assumes the rightful attitude before god i am but a little child and know not how to go out or to come in the pride of doing sends its poison all through our praying the same pride of being infects the same pride of being infects all our prayers no matter how well worded they may be it was this lack of humility this self applauding this self exaltation which kept the most religious man of Christ the day the most religious man of Christ's day from being accepted of God and the same thing will keep us in this day from being accepted of God oh that now i might decrease oh that all i am might cease let me into nothing fall let my lord be all in all